like to ask our leadership folks who were sitting and watching a lot of the conversation we just had, if anything, just to talk about what struck you, what things, issues rose to the surface that you might want to, um, to talk about, to address. I think it's very compelling to hear <coughs> Uh, from people that have been through uh, problems with being homeless. And I was very struck by uh, the appreciation that you seem to have uh, felt from, from getting those services and, and that help. Did it make you think about anything in terms of policy, Senator Ryan? I believe that um, that is a very important component of um, trying to uh, prevent um, these kind of situations from occurring in the future. Uh, getting testimonials um, and actually I think at some point I'd like to see um, with regard to welfare or some kind of public assistance if somebody receives uh, a gift from the government that they have some kind of requirement to go back and give a little bit I think that empowers people what about in terms of what you could do in the legislature I'll put you on the spot <laughs> As you noticed, um, there are a number of different agencies involved in, uh, in different aspects of what causes homelessness. And uh, I think there's a need to bring all those agencies together to do assessments, see what the needs are, see what uh, the resources are within the different agencies, um, and come up with plans together. You and Representative O'Neill worked to pass a joint memorial, I think, last that's year? That's exactly what that is. That's what that is? Said. So is it moving forward? Is it funded or? It, it is uh, in the beginning stages and, and we do have some committed legislators to now take it to the next step, which is uh, to create a little coalition task force uh, where we're meeting frequently to discuss these issues. And Did it get funded? We, we stripped the funding. Uh, the funding was the, uh, uh, the part that was gonna tie up the bill. Um, as you know, we, we've been addressing very serious uh, fiscal issues within the state and so having a funding component on it at this point was, uh, uh, would have probably killed it. Um, I think the first step is to uh, bring everybody together and, uh, and, then, uh, and then go for the funding. Tim, you're on the Senate uh, Revenue and Stabilization Committee. Give us, what's the uh, fiscal outlook right now? Well, the, the good news is we are uh, looking at a, at a surplus situation and it ranges depending on who you talk to and in terms of uh, previous commitments to things like Medicaid, uh, really from about 150 million to 250 million. And that, you know, to put it in perspective, is, is really a tiny piece of an overall seven, six to seven billion dollar budget. So uh, the good news is there's a surplus, there are some extra funds. The bad news is it is not a lot, especially to spread around statewide. Can I talk to our community people here? What can we do to advance the conversation beyond like, we don't have any money? I think, I mean, I wanted to maybe point out that it's really an investment um, in our community to make sure that people aren't homeless. And if we look at Matilda's situation, she was able to continue her education. She now has a job, and her job is giving back to the community. So we were able to make that investment in Matilda, and it's going to pay off. Is it, I mean, can we reframe the issue to think about it in those terms? Does that help when you're going? To the city, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, it does. Uh, okay. With regard to Albuquerque Heading Home, which is the homeless initiative that has been undertaken in the last couple of years by the city of Albuquerque, uh, we have private dollars that have been invested in Albuquerque Heading Home. It's not just a government program. Why are private investors investing in that? Because of just exactly what we, we were just hearing, it really is an investment. Uh, the tagline of Albuquerque Heading Home is the smart way to do the right thing. It's the smart way because of the huge number of dollars that are being spent on these particular individuals that we're housing that are now being saved because they are stably housed. So ideally you've saved money because you're focusing on the most chronic homeless people who use the most services. That's right. right. What's the idea if you, I'm not sure you've gotten far enough along to have a windfall, but if you do, then what's the idea, what, what do you do with that extra money? <laughs> well, and it's not all our extra money okay. as far as taxpayer dollars that come to the city. It may be extra money that goes to a hospital or extra money that goes to 
Bernalillo County for the operation of the jail, those kinds of things. So it, it, you're right, it takes a great deal of coordination to redirect that money uh, so that we're providing affordable housing for the people who need it. My dream is that Albuquerque heading home, although right now it's focused on chronically homeless and those who are medically vulnerable, uh, both behaviorally and, and physically, uh, but that it will eventually be focused on, for example, families with children. I want to challenge you a little bit in terms of I see the logic, especially if you're going to legislators and you need to prove a return on investment by focusing on the people who cost the most, the most chronic homeless. So you sort of focus on that. You don't focus on some of the women we have here who have families but what is the cost to their children by not getting the services early on? We know now so much about early brain development and what happens if kids are in traumatic situations or homeless and the enormous cost to us 10 years down the road because well, sir of that. Certainly, Albuquerque Heading Home isn't the only thing that we're doing. Uh, the city of <laughs> Albuquerque, for example, spends about $12.6 million a year on homeless prevention and homeless services. So it's not all going to that small group of the most vulnerable. It's being spread throughout the community uh, to, to deal with Cuidando, for example, and enable people who have children to use that facility, a uh, Barrett House, St. Martin's. Virtually everyone who's here uh, has uh, some connection with, with the funds that we s expend in the community. That's what right. I'm hearing from a lot of our providers is that we need more, right? <laughs> is there a way to get more? <laughs> we're missing an opportunity okay. uh, with housing. Uh, the Community Reinvestment Act uh, is a congressional act from 1977 that says lending institutions will invest in their communities where they gather deposits. And so since the mortgage crises, we have pretty much overlooked that opportunity. We've kind of let the banks go because there's been so much going on. But now I think it's time to redirect our efforts and get back to what can banking do? Because the banking industry, quite frankly, has recovered. They're offering uh, new mortgages. Uh, it has, it's, the industry is pretty healthy. And I think it's time for them to take a look back and see we as taxpayers have done a lot to save that industry. And it's time for them to really take to task, take us to take them to task about the Community Reinvestment Act. That means that they will give dollars into these communities for housing, affordable housing, small businesses, employment opportunities. What do you think about that, Senators? When we think about the social determinants of homelessness, you know, I think one of them does have to do with access to credit in our, in our society. And it also has to do with the disconnect between uh, the folks who receive the credit and the folks who give the credit. Right now, that, that connection, unless you're going through a community bank or a credit union, is basically totally separated. So there, there is no relationship there, actually. And you know, my background is actually in banking. And, and the fundamental basis behind banking is actually you know, a social reinforcement so that payments are made. And so I actually think in the long term, this is a problem for the banking industry. And it's why we see default rates continuing to rise, because we don't have that one-on-one -on -one or community reinforcement mechanism anymore. And so you know, that's a, a zoom out on a big picture structural problem. But I think it's one of the many social determinants that are driving things like homelessness. I think there's a clear distinction between the community banks and the federal banks. And I think we should be looking at the federal banks. Yeah. So is there a way can, can they pressure National banks. I think there's pressure to be had to invest by elected in officials, well, not only you, locally but also yeah. at the federal level. Mm -hmm. And I think the way to to, to 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 manifest that pressure is to connect the lender and the borrower. And whether it's a national bank, you know, if you think of, for example, Wells Fargo. I mean, I had a mortgage with them and so forth. That's all syndicated nationally. So the individual who actually owns my uh, mortgage you know, is actually, I mean, it's a million different people in several different countries. And I guess, you know, I'm just suge suggesting that's a, mm -hmm. that's a connection that'll, that is going to, it's, it's required to accomplish the kind of community reinvestment that we're Wait, talking about. I, I would take a, a softer approach. I, I, I like the approach of a, an upfront investment. We're spending money early to catch people before they head down these paths mm -hmm. to where it's going to be much more expensive if, if they continue down the same path. Cuidando Los Niños and, and other providers have, 
huge success rates on when they take a family in. Uh, I think theirs is 85 percent, if not uh, <coughs> greater than that. And, that. and that tells people that if we spend money on this problem, we're going to solve it, you're going to spend the money wisely, and, and I think that's um, powerful. Many of us are in a place where we think that homelessness is this unsolvable, intractable problem which makes spending government dollars on it very unappealing for many people because it feels like they're just throwing away money on a problem that's never going to be solved. As advocates, we can do a much better job educating decision makers about the fact that homelessness is in fact a solvable problem. I mean, we can show that if we spend these dollars um, on programs that we know work, we can end homelessness for people in our community. So where do we need to be spending the dollars? One, we need to invest in affordable housing, particularly affordable rental housing for uh, families and individuals with low incomes. And then we also need to be investing in programs and services that help people address issues that contributed to their homelessness. So it might be domestic violence, it might be um, limited education or not finishing high schools, so it might be um, just uh, life skills around interacting with other people. I mean, I think a lot of um, what the folks in the room have talked about are great examples of help they've been able to receive from these programs. So is there an appetite for getting more money in the legislature if we can reframe the issue and say, look, this isn't just this intractable thing. There's, there's good models that can help. I, I think there's some groundwork that needs to be done with regard to um, combining all these different areas. I mean, we can't, you can't walk in and say, we've got to solve housing, we've got to solve job training, we've got to solve education, we've got to solve health care issues, we've got to solve uh, behavioral health issues. We, we, that's too big. It, it, it needs a, a coordinated effort that comes up with uh, what are the resources needed to address a problem based on uh, an assessment and, and then go in and make the pitch as to uh, where the funds go and how they go. Our coalition just started an effort to develop a statewide plan to end homelessness. So this would encompass family homelessness, homelessness among individuals, people with disabilities, veterans. And that plan we're hoping is really going to be a dynamic plan that actually gets implemented. And we're just starting, but the idea is to bring in many of the state agencies that you were talking about to be part of this plan to help develop these solutions and to really take a um, systematic approach to looking at what would it take to really have an impact on homelessness in our state. So this would be in addition to the legislation that yeah, Senator and in Ryan fact, this, was this legislation that um, Senator Ryan had sponsored a couple years ago, there was a preliminary report that came out of that task force, and so we're uh, as we're developing this statewide plan, we're looking at well, what are the other planning efforts that have already taken place in the state? We don't really need to recreate the wheel here. We can already pull from a lot of the work that we've done. I also wanted to. Um, let folks know that one of the things we'll be working on during this upcoming legislative session is asking for an increase in rapid rehousing services. Um, so we'll be asking the legislature to increase funding for rapid rehousing services by $500,000, and that is specifically short to medium term rental assistance and services to help homeless families um, quickly exit homelessness into permanent housing. What do, you, what do you all think of that? That's something I would definitely support and, and have supported in the past. I think it's equally as, as uh, unproductive to just focus on a plan for homelessness without not addressing things like the credit crisis in America or the healthcare situation where people trade off surgery for their mortgage. Uh, and that happens a lot in my district in the Southeast Heights. A lot of the transience and homelessness is caused because people are coming in from rural areas, particularly reservations, to get health care. And then they can't afford a place to stay. Uh, so, I, I, you know, it's, this is why it's a tough problem, but I, I, I believe there's a little bit of hold up the mirror and say it takes more than a plan. This is also about poverty. I think that if we were to educate the young people and instill more values and show them that there's more hope than just having kids and struggling or trying to be in a relationship and struggling. Like, for me, like, um, life to me was find somebody, have kids, and be happily ever after. That's not, that's not how the story goes. You 
first have to know the partner. You have to <laughs> know where you're going. You, you know, it's not what you think it's going to be. And, um, and like, I'm a smart girl. I was smart in school. I just made bad choices. Um, some of it was because of what people said I couldn't do or I wasn't worth it or worth, you know, why are you having these kids? Why did you do this? Why, you know, and then you just keep digging yourself deeper and deeper and deeper. And then you like, you wake up one day and you're like, huh, where am I? What am I doing? I wake up every day like, did I really have five kids? Like, really? <laughs> <laughs> what was I thinking? But you know, you're under so much stress and you have different things in your life. And you're trying to support your kids. You're trying to be happy. You're trying to do this. They, I don't know, maybe my conscience just turned off. And I was just like, well, this is what, you know, this is what I am. I'm not going to be anybody successful. I'm just going to have these kids and I'm just going to, you know, raise them and deal with my unhealthy relationship. And this is just the way it is, but it's not. And through the RISE program, they gave me hope. I was so scared of conflict. I couldn't just say, oh, no, I deserve this. I need this. You know, it was always like, okay, well, I guess we'll just struggle. Okay, well, we'll figure it out. Oh, we'll do. But now I know that, you know, we're worth more. And I really honestly feel that I know it is hard with um, income. But I feel that if we just reached out to the community and gave them hope, you know, just be able to turn to someone like, oh, my rent is due. You know, what can I do about it? Because after you struggle so much you're like who cares who cares if i'm not gonna be able to pay the rent and then you just start you know spending money stupidly oh wow well, we're <laughs> i'm not gonna be able to pay the rent or i can't pay for the insurance and you're driving around with no insurance and then you lose your license and guess what you gotta ride the bus and you gotta tag along the kids you know there's just so much me I, for me it's mental well what would you i would ask stephanie and angelica and karen what would you do if you didn't have these programs I don't know, I'd probably be in the streets because like I don't have any support from my mom. I mean I see my mom and stuff but like she's not like, you know, like all there. She's like have her own family and stuff and I'd probably just be out there just with my kids in the cold or or in hunger or crying for hungry. What how is the how have you found hope in the in the safe house? How has that helped? It's like People that just helping me, looking for a house for me and my kids, just to be like supported there. And I'm really happy to be in there. Has it been hard to ask for that? <laughs> yeah. It was uh, extremely hard for me because I worked 20 years um, as a social worker back on the reservation and supported my family and basically um, my late father had always pushed education, and that was my key to my independence and in how to support myself, so I stayed on that track. And after working 20 years and deciding to, okay, I can put it one notch up and go back for my master's, that's where I think um, I had to sacrifice, because as the length of time you're unemployed, I think the chances starts also declining and it's very hard to get back into the workforce because they see your resume and oh this was years ago and but you're still trying to explain okay I'm still in school and you know I'm trying to uh, improve myself in every way I can and I can do this job but yet I don't know there's there's something there that just was not seen as uh, reputable or respected or um, given the credit that it deserved so I think um, just that in itself and uh, it was very hard to admit and say okay I, I need help so um, then going to the to the agencies like T TANF ISD office uh, for help to supplement my income or temporary you know, assistance to needy families yes um, it was not enough to make rent getting $118 is not enough that's what you put, got a month yes and what I do for that is give 30 hours of my time to go through the hoops of what I need to do uh, to continue to get funding for the program. And I'm supposed to be saving. It's impossible. And when you break all that down, it's like <clears throat> you're only getting $2.35 an hour. On top of that, you have to even do more. So this brings me back to Senator Ryan's first comment, you were saying people who perhaps get federal help or, or state help from the government should 
perhaps have some requirements, but what you're saying is you have to do things to get. I have to. Uh, what do you have to do to get? To we, first of all, we're expected to participate in the New Mexico Works program, and they are the ones that basically give us activities. And there's not enough activities. There's activities only, like what? Uh, job search. Okay. Uh, work experience. Uh, volunteering. There's only three uh, type of activities that will fund a bus ticket or transportation. That's um, job search and work experience and going to school, I believe. The, the rest are not funded. Like if you were to volunteer or get counseling to improve yourself to, you know, they're, they're not. Uh, Say work on substance abuse yes, issues or, or other. Or self-esteem or what, what have you. Um, you know, like traumatic uh, PTSD from their experiences, some type of counseling that is needed to, to help uh, this person along to improve themselves. As you pursue the, um, the task force, Senator Ryan, in addition to the agencies coming together to make sure they're collaborating, will they be seeking input from people who are impacted by this, this issue? Our legislation also included clients and they're participating in, uh, in determining how we, uh, how we resolve and solve these problems. At the City of Albuquerque, we have just finished doing our comprehensive five-year plan, and the way we did it was through focus groups, community groups, providers, and users of, of services coming together and giving us information. What we wanted to do was prioritize the way we spend our dollars. Uh, certainly, the huge need is affordable housing. And, you know, I, I love what Diana has to say about the, the vacant houses that could be used for families. I think there are lots of ways of handling it. Also, I'm just reading some information out of Detroit and how neighborhoods have come together uh, to purchase houses that are vacant and fix them up uh, either commercially or by volunteer effort and then offer them to people who need them. So those kinds of things are possible and I think it's really exciting to think about those for for our community. If Detroit can do that, they have serious housing problems. Yes. Surely we can do that. I think so too. If we think about even just driving up and down Central and some of those hotels that are in, you know, ill repair, disuse, I mean, that's easy uh, transitional, you know, no one would want to make that permanent, but permanent, but uh, easy transitional housing stock that we could use better. And as I think about, you know, maybe some low hanging fruit, there's there's two areas that, that jump out, and one is funding, you know, the rehabilitation of those through the Mortgage Finance Authority. And, you know, I think, to be honest, that organization does a lot of good, and a lot of these programs run through that organization. And you have to kind of just call it like it is and say that we should fund them more. I think we get a very high return on our investment uh, for doing that. The second thing, I think, is this formula that you mentioned for that we use for uh, uh, you know, assistance for needy families. And there's an issue with means testing so that there's actually a disincentive to do things, as I understand it, like if you want to get English lessons, so, you know, if your English isn't that good, that doesn't count as education. Yeah. So, you know, that's an issue. Or if you need a car to do your interviews and so forth, if you buy that, all of a sudden you have an asset that you have to subtract from your score. <laughs> we need to make it so that uh, uh, folks who are on public assistance are rewarded for making the right choices. Right now, that's not the case. You are financially penalized for making those decisions right now. And also just, I mean, something that I don't think would cost a lot of money is for organizations to actually talk to each other, especially in like social services. I have a family who has just graduated and they're in housing and she's working full time, but to keep her, ch her childcare vouchers and her, um, her food stamps, she's had to go to the, the child care office and then go to the food stamp office and they won't call each other. No, you have to go back because we didn't get the facts from them. So go back to the other office. She's had to take off, she said, four days this month to have to go to different appointments because they won't call. I'm like, that doesn't cost a lot of money for you to call and say, did you get my fax? Did you get my, <laughs> like, like you, to shuttle people around, that's taking all some of the time. Are some of the bus and that takes how many hours out of your day? Yeah. Yeah. Are there some inefficiencies you hope could be addressed with? You know, government in and of itself is, is very inefficient. I mean, you, you talk to agency heads and these agencies don't have the same 
computers as these ones, they, they, ju they just don't talk to each other. Um, you know, a private sector model that um, uh, is more like a one-stop shop that, that you can go to and that person is going to assess your needs. Is it housing? Is it transportation? Is it writing your resume? Is it your presentation? Is it what do you need? And once they make the assessment, then they direct them to the programs that they know work and that are that have proven successful. Uh, that kind of model, I think, is 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 more appropriate. I thank you all for coming and talking. I know this is a really complicated issue, and I appreciate you all sharing your stories. I know that's difficult, and sitting and talking with us. But thank you very much for coming on Public Square. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.